I'm Christina Williams. I'm a senior manager at Cisco Systems. Um, I manage customer identity and access and also our data protection and privacy. Uh, Dilip Gaurapati is our cloud and platform architect. Rakesh Rao is our identity and uh, solution architect. So our CIM journey started uh, about three and a half years ago. Um, we started with a six-month strategy phase where we defined our business case and strategy. We followed up. The first year was around implementing a cloud-native identity a, a, as a service. We used Ping Directory as our underlying. It was Unbound ID, but then it was acquired by Ping. Um, we implemented all containerized, completely cloud-native. All the rest of the components are open source. In the second year, what we tackled was around the brownfield migration. We had a legacy system at Cisco that uh, was around for almost 20 years, I think. Um, we essentially migrated off of that, and uh, it is now uh, our current system supports Cisco.com. A lot of our, um, almost all of our external um, supported applications, and then we started onboarding some of our products. We are in the third year right now. A lot of the focus is around scaling the adoptions, um, tackling hybrid cloud, and some risk and compliance, particularly around FedRAMP. So I'll talk a little bit about the customer identity access and the business opportunities and challenges that we face. Um, traditionally, customer IM, just to talk about a little bit about the actors. Most people think of CIM as that external user, your guests, your customers, your partners and your suppliers. But you shouldn't forget the other actors in the, the picture, and particularly your internal workforce administrators. Those are the ones that may be uh, supporting your customers or the administrators of your um, products. Um, they, and sometimes they even have impersonization um, type capabilities within your platform. So they are also a key piece of this. And then we also, of course, in a cloud-native world, it's all API-based, microservices-based, so your service accounts come into play. And today, always, we have a lot of bots, chat bots, other things, and other interactive bots, so machine accounts around bots come into play. And then in the enterprise world, you think about BOIOD, uh, bring your own device in terms of that. But in the customer IM space, particularly for us, it's around IoT and your devices, your products, uh, calling home, getting support, services, updates, um, even registering themselves initially. So CIM is really about knowing your customer. And what we face, I think uh, all companies that are doing this face, is you get this fragmentation. And what we're trying to do is get this 360-degree view of your customer. But it's... Unlike the enterprise world where it's a little bit more focused on your workforce, we have a very diverse um, pieces and you're trying to look at the customer through their own, throughout their life cycle in terms of the first part of I am aware where your content, you know, browsing, going to events like Cisco Live. The middle section is around I shop, they're maybe doing quotes, training, um, certifications, um, I buy is your commerce transactions, your renewal transactions. You get, of course, the usage piece where there is licensing involved, but a lot of the product and service usage comes into play there. And then support, where you have your tech support, professional services, returns, and things like that. Whether you have a fragmented system or not, um, at Cisco we acquire a lot of companies, so no matter how we work at bringing it together. There's always new acquisitions that come into play that is always adding to this landscape of fragmentation. So you have to keep that in mind. So the other piece of the CIM world is the business opportunity. And like many companies, um, we are transitioning from a hardware-based um, company to more of a subscription-based SaaS hybrid uh, type of landscape. And then because of that, you're having to look at this interaction, this customer experience, across the entire life cycle of all the touch points that your customer is interacting with you. And how those interactions work are really important. And it does translate to some key things. Customers really want a convenient, omni-channel, personalized, and secure interaction with you. And based on some uh, research, there is dollars to it, 73% of Customers are, are, say that 
experience. A good experience is key to the brand loyalty. 52% would spend more for a faster and efficient customer experience. And there is dollars to it. There's a 16% price premium they're willing to pay for this better experience. I won't read all of this, but in the CIM world, I think the main opportunity to take away from this, it's beyond just your authentication and authorization in this world. It's around the business enabler, this unified view of the customer. And if you look at the biggest marketing trends of 2019, it's around such things as this data, right? How do you drive data as a strategic di differentiator? How do you provide that seamless experience as you interact through different um, methods, mobile, web, even, you know, your echoes. Shopping today is evolving. It's not always going to be on a web and computer. People are ordering off of uh, echoes and Google Homes. So you have those kind of uh, interactions that you have to factor in. Personalization is key. A lot of our marketing is also moving to, they don't want to serve the same content, they want to personalize the content and provide different content based on who they are, what the, the customer is, who, who the user are, where they are in their journey with us. But you, you do that by driving data and, and AI, but you have to do it with privacy and ethical AI um, to do that. The other marketing trend that's key that's happening is around um, you need to know the user, but you also have, it's, it's in the framework of an account. So in B2B world, you have to understand where companies are coming from. It's not just a user to just knowing the user. You need to know what company they are from so that you drive that interaction based on the account and not just the user. And the last thing, as I showed in the racetrack that we had in the previous slide, this whole business of experience is the next, where they're saying the next step of digital transformation is happening. So I'm going to pass it over to Mikesh. He's going to talk a little bit about our architecture. Thanks, Christina. So uh, you heard of all of the business enablers that we had to support. So we had certain um, architecture drivers that we sort of looked at to make this possible, right? Um, IDAS for products and services, one of the first that we, we sort of got to hear because we had to be that uh, identity as a service for our products and services, including IT applications internal. Uh, we had to be able to be bundled across uh, with the products because there would be certain scenarios where we wouldn't uh, have any connections outward to the internet, so bundled and, and boxed and sent to the partner's uh, uh, premises was the other uh, big requirements. And that's the, the portability that I'm talking about. And because we sort of inserted ourselves within the um, login flow or the authentication flow for some of the products, we had to be really resilient. We go down, nobody can log into the uh, product, right? So it's pretty much down. And similarly for all of the Cisco.com IT applications that we talk about, we are in the critical path. So if we go down, nobody logs into anything. And all of the the, uh, um, the journey that Christina spoke about is pretty much dead because nobody can get into uh, you know um, commerce or any of those applications. Agility is the, the other big driver for us um, because we were looking at IT applications on one end and all of the SaaS products on the other, the acquisitions that Cisco has done, we had a, a good mix of um, requirements, if you will, right? Business requirements that we had to um, we had to solve and, and, and be ready for. So being agile to be able to do all of that was the other big requirement for us. We had to be really, really quick to, to uh, you know, get to market for these products. Security goes without saying. Obviously, we, we are the identity, so we had to be secure. Also, um, some of the products that we have are, are in the security space. So it goes without saying that we had to step up our game to be able to sort of live up to that expectation. Compliance, um, we were, actually we, we, it's two and a half years since we started this journey. So we were sort of getting ready when GDPR and all of those requirements were hitting us. So we had to be compliant from ground up. Uh, we had to be designed for compliance ground up. And portability was the other reason. Uh, compliance and portability pretty much go together. We had to be able to be deployed in a data center in another region if that's a requirement that's, that's sort of presented to us. So these were some of the uh, drivers that we, we looked at. And this was the sort of high level architecture that uh, you know, we, we sort of came up with. Um, I'll talk about the right hand side first. 
We have certain UIs, obviously, for user lifecycle management, user registration, profile management, you know, password recovery, and all of those things. We, we looked at a few technologies. React is what we settled down on. All of these applications, all of these UIs, um, talk to our microservices through a, through a sort of common API gateway. That API gateway gives us the ability to um, you know, provide uh, more security in terms of visibility of, of who's calling whom, which uh, UI is calling uh, you know, which app, a microservice. Uh, API clients, direct API clients, also go through the same path, so we have a, a better control about you know, who, which API client is calling these microservices, be able to provide rate limiting and uh, services such as that. Under that, we have the stateful and stateless microservices, right? a uh, whole bunch of uh, ser services that uh, sort of provide capabilities like profile credential management. Uh, we have invite-based flows that, that solve uh, certain requirements for our, for our products. And a lot of uh, stateful services which rely on some of the data stores uh, at the bottom. And we have uh, a good mix of LDAP. And Christina spoke about our use of ping directory. Uh, we have uh, a few NoSQL databases and RDBMS that we use for our requirements. This is the, the main stack for the, uh, for the platform. And to manage this, we have on the left a bunch of management uh, services that we have. Um, because we wanted to be portable, because we had to be agile, because we had to be sort of uh, secure, we, we chose uh, Docker and Kubernetes as our base sort of platform. We wanted to use that to be able to leverage some of the capabilities that containers give us, uh, uh, leverage some of the orchestration capabilities that Docker give us. And because of that, we had to uh, have a service discovery. Because there's really no uh, dedicated IP in the container world. Your, your node spawns up, your pod comes up on any node. You can't have a dedicated IP. You can't hard code anything. So we had to have service discovery that provides us you know, the visibility or the, the sort of path to a particular service. Configuration management, key management, or the other two um, functionalities that we had. Key management was very critical for us because all of these secrets are pretty much um, external to our to our applications, to our microservices, into the key management. Observability, we had uh, we have logging, tracing, uh, metrics, uh, monitoring. Monitoring is the other key aspect for us, which also ties back into our alerting. A lot of our um, recovery-based mechanisms is all based on the monitoring and the alerting uh, that we that we have built. On the infrastructure, we have orchestration and container registry. Uh, container registry is, is where all of our Docker uh, containers are, are put in. And that's where uh, it, it, that's the sort of main repository from where we, we pull and we deploy. And we have dedicated CI CD uh, for build automation. And uh, we have security testing and, and automated uh, QA testing, functional testing as part of this. 12-factor apps, I'm not going to drain through this, but this is, uh, this is something that we, we uh, chose to go with in the container world. Cloud-native applications pretty much uh, swear by these principles. We also you know, try to be as close to these principles as possible. As an example, I mean, configurations, number three, is, is what I'd, I'd sort of just like to pick and, and explain. Configuration management in the cloud-native uh, world, it just says that you have to have all of the configurations, your application configurations, outside of your application. You cannot hard code it. I think traditionally we have all had all of the configurations bundled in and deployed as part of the application. This pretty much says that you have to keep that separate because your same container image goes from your dev stage to prod, and configuration is the only thing that changes, and that's why you have to keep it out, and, and that's better control over your, your uh, application. You can take a look at it. The URL is the bottom. I won't drain this. Next, I'd, I'd really like to talk through some of the uh, learnings that we had as we went through this journey. And I'll touch upon the, the phases that Christina spoke about. Um, we, we deployed this. We built this. We deployed this. And the first thing that we did was really try to hook into our brownfield existing legacy IAM system on, on Cisco.com. Um, we looked at all of the data that we had, um, we used this opportunity to really go through the lifecycle management uh, phase for it, um, sort of reached out, figured out who are the inactive users, uh, users that have not been active for the last maybe three years or so, and then just picked all of the active ones, the most active ones, and then did the migration over to the new platform. We just took this opportunity to clean up data that we didn't have to carry over to the new uh, platform. So we just, just use that for the migration. But also knew that there are uh, users that don't regularly log into Cisco.com, they don't have a need to do it every day, right? So 
we had a just-in-time uh, migration built in, so we could sort of uh, move them over as and when they log in. And when we did this, we, we, pre we thought it wouldn't really be used as much. And I, most active users, they log in, that's, that's the only sort of uh, user base that we see. But to our surprise, there were quite a few people who actually woke up after we went live and started logging in, right? So the just-in-time really saved us at that point. And because we had a legacy system and we had this new sort of uh, platform that we stood up, we wanted to make sure that the end user didn't look at it as two different platforms. It was seamless for the end user. To make that happen, uh, we, we created a, a custom data sync between the legacy and the new platform. And on the legacy side, we still have uh, IT applications that use it. Uh, a lot of APIs that get called, a lot of uh, uh, user identities that are created on the legacy side. We wanted to make sure that the two are kept in sync, so we had a very custom data sync uh, implemented so that you know, the two platforms are, are uh, you know, it just sees, it's, it's just sees and seen as one for the end user. The other big uh, learning for us really the decomposition into microservices. The, the new platform is all microservices. The legacy platform, over so many years, we have pretty much inherited all of that as a bunch of monoliths uh, that work. So once we started looking at how to decompose these into microservices, we, we very quickly realized that the legacy applications have a, a, an assumption of, of the data state, of the profile of a user. So when a data is, when a user profile is created in the legacy store, there are certain assumptions made on, on certain attributes being present, certain validations being done. And we were trying to break all of those things in the new world to make them, you know, microservices, asynchronous, can we do this at a later time? It doesn't have to be synchronous. Those were questions that we were asking ourselves without even realizing that it's going to break a bunch of services. So that's the other big learning that we had where you, you can't assume that your change on the new world is just going to magically work. There are a lot of assumptions being made and on the data, and you have to be able to you know, cater to those, be able to sort of live up to those uh, expectations on the, on the legacy side. And certain applications that that pretty much call, let's say, a one one SQL um, procedure or maybe one API, and then expected everything to magically work, suddenly broke because now they had to call five different microservices because that's the coolest kid on the block, and we are like changing everything. Right? Rewiring was the other big uh, thing that we had a pushback on. A lot of people said it just works. What's my incentive to change this? So it was a it's a lot of difficulty that we had to go through to convince them to change it. But yes, applications have to be rewired if they have to move over to the new world and there's a whole bunch of microservices that are, that are being thrown at them. And tenancy is the, uh, the, the other big uh, factor for us. The legacy systems had no concept of tenancy. I mean, it's all one big blob of, uh, you know, user store and everybody lives in there. And here we were uh, bringing in the concept of multi-tenancy and that was alien and it still is alien for some of them, right? They, they had to be... They had to know the context of the tenancy. They had to make every call in the context of the tenancy that they've never done before. So that was very, very new for them. And we still get pushbacks on, on, on uh, you know, implementing these things. And because we were bringing this in and they had to know the context, we implemented Webfinger as a way for them to discover the tenancy context and then make calls to the API within that context. So this, on the brownfield side, these were some of the, the biggest sort of learnings for us. And we continue to hit these points over and over again as we start talking to new new teams within uh, within the application state space. As we moved uh, to talking to our adopters from Cisco.com to bringing in some more products that are existing and trying to have them adopt our uh, platform, we saw sort of varying risk um, based on the IDPs, and I, I say that because. There are certain um, products that say we are totally okay with you bringing in social login. You know, somebody logs in with their Facebook ID, we are okay to take them in, I have no problem. On the other side, we have products that says absolutely not. Unless you do an MFA for this user, that user is not coming into my application. So we have, you know, varying sort of requirements and that's the risk appetite we saw, which sort of went from one end of the spectrum to the other. So we had to be able to manage that and, and sort of build in flows and workflows that, that these products can use and sort of customize that for their uh, use. The other one is uh, identity broker chaining. We, we already had a few uh, products that, that were using uh, identity brokers and uh, they wanted to use one ID or that's the, the product that we, we call ourselves. They wanted to use us in that mix. So they already had a relationship with a broker and we were coming in the middle 
and probably have another broker that they wanted to talk to. The bunch of chaining that was starting to happen. And now we had to look at how do we pass this context of the, the um, IDP across to the final broker that's going to really throw up that discovery challenge and, and ask the user, what's your email, who are you? Right? None of us were supposed to do that. We were all supposed to be silently passing this on. And that was the other big challenge that, that uh, you know, we faced. How do we start to pass this, this context across multiple IDPs and, and uh, you know, sort of land to the final one? The, the other requirement that we quickly sort of figured out we had to do was a uh, concept of ID, uh, attribute store. Attribute store um, is, is a store that we, uh, we want to build where you'll have all of the non-core attributes of the user profile. So let's say a product comes in, and I'm going to take just Cisco Live as an example. I sign in for Cisco Live. They ask me things about what's your t-shirt size, what's your preference of your, your room, right? Smoking, non-smoking, et cetera. That's not a core profile, user profile. And that's not what we typically store as part of our, our uh, user profile data. So we want the, the capability for these products to be able to store this as part of the, uh, the platform so that when they ask for the user profile or when the user gets authenticated and it's, it's sent back, we send all of these as part of the claims. We wanted one uh, central space where they could store it. The other reason was for to prevent the, the proliferation of uh, identity data. In, in, at least in the IT side, we have seen a lot of these people start to uh, copy the identity data over and have their own copy of it, just because they had this one extra attribute that we don't support in the common uh, sort of central space, right? So we wanted to use this attribute store to break that practice and say we will have all of this in one store. It just gives us better control of, of all of this data and uh, you know, start to look at privacy rules when they come in and hit us. Um, user lifecycle management, this was just you know, tracking users as they change companies. Um, you know, companies merge or a user leaves from one company to another. We want to be able to give that seamless sort of uh, transition path to the user and pro continue to provide that same personalization that we used to do in the previous company that uh, he or she had. So we want to be able to you know, carry that forward and also um, provide the user with any path to carry that personal certifications over. You have CCIE, CCNA, any Cisco certifications. You should be able to carry that forward without losing it as part of your previous profile. So that was the other um, lifecycle management decision that we did, make it easy for users to carry that, those things over. Federation, we, we spoke about a lot of uh, in our rules about federation and how that's going to solve a lot of problems. 100% federation is a stretch goal for us because we have, you know, top tier partners that are, you know, technically savvy and are, are ready to jump on this bandwagon, and we have small um, uh, companies that have no technical uh, expertise, and they don't want to do because there are just five people in that company that are doing it. It's just a, a, a waste of resources for them to go through this uh, federation. So 100% is not going to happen. So we have to look at ways to support this. Both, both of this, right? Local uh, authentication as well as federation. Delegated administration is, is very, uh, I wouldn't say unique to Cisco, but our, our um, model is based on partners. It's all partner-based model, so our selling goes through the partners. On the hardware side, it used to be through the partners. It still is for some of the uh, SaaS products. So we have to be able to support the partner model and the customer model. So a partner model in terms of having the partner manage a customer, as well as customers managing their own end users. So we have to manage both of this. We have a B2B, a B2C, because we do, do, we do um, business with customers directly, and a B2B2C. So we have all sort of channels that we have to be able to support. And, and we want to make sure that the administration of these users and administration of resources from partners to customers are all taken care of within that, uh, within that bucket and adapting to evolving business models. I think this goes without saying, we, like I said, we have products on either side of the, the spectrum, and they have their own requirements, and our business model from Cisco itself is changing rapidly, so we want to be able to um, rapidly sort of evolve to that. Along with this, um, we also have uh, some of the technical learnings um, when we are trying to build this product. Uh, so as this journey started in 2017, um, Docker, uh, Java and most of the technologies are evolving at that point in time. So th the primary thing that we have decided as part of the architecture is all of our artifacts are Docker images. So when you think about it on how earlier products were shipped, uh, the mindset has to change when you're shipping them using Docker containers. 
So this is also a lot of learning for our developers as they are transitioning from a traditional development into cloud native and container world. So we said that instead of burdening the developers with newer technologies and additional responsibilities, we would standardize the Docker images so that we have sort of operating system and sort of best practices within the image building practice so that all developers can leverage that. So pick choices like uh, Alpine image, which is just a 5 MB image, uh, which gives you the complete operating system, to CentOS, which can be blown up uh, to 500 meg. Right. So keeping that standardization and smaller images helped us in maintaining the security posture, that you have lesser vulnerability exposure, also faster boot times, because when your container is restarting, you have to pull the image, and smaller images are always faster to load. When you're looking at developers shipping out the products, earlier you were uh, versioning the artifacts, uh, like your jars and wars and so on. With the addition of Docker, now you have to start thinking about versioning your Docker images as well, because your jar or war is part of that image, and that is where you would tag all your features or bugs related to that one. Right. As a best practice, uh, in one of the 12 factors that you've seen or anything related to containers, you would see that um, one process per container is ideally recommended, but it is not always the case, so we do make some exceptions that some of the products that we have taken off the shelf, which are not meant to run in containers, need some additional work, but that is still okay to manage those things. As long as you don't treat your Docker image as a VM and try to load everything into the same thing. Uh, debugging is another critical thing. Traditional developments, like you have deployed your application, something is not working, you quickly log into the VM or server, try to install some additional tools, and then try to debug that one. In container world, you de deal it in a different way. Instead of modifying your actual application image, you have to vary uh, patterns like, can I build a different image uh, with an additional set of tools and then deploy it in the existing environment? Or can I do tools like uh, sidecar patterns where you can have additional tools in a container that is not actually modifying your application container but running in the same namespace as your container, uh, which uh, can still help you in uh, debugging some of those scenarios. But in any case, um, as you're expanding your scope of uh, what you're shipping just from uh, jars or wires or uh, artifacts, you're also right now shipping your operating system as part of uh, your product. So you're also taking in a lot more responsibility from the security perspective, and you have to be due diligent in scanning for vulnerabilities in the container images. But typically, doing it through a CI/CD is one of the best practice, so that you are actually catching that you are not shipping any known vulnerabilities or any vulnerabilities that already have fixes into the environment. Um, that helps us in uh, putting as a gate to this one. Once we move past the containers, uh, what is running in the containers is majority of our microservices are uh, Java-based. Of course, there are other services that are non-Java, but a few of the lessons that we have learned putting uh, Java services in containers was that Java was not really ready for containerization. Uh, issues like uh, not understanding the memory limits that you put on container actually impacts your application. This is not the problem of the application, but the problem of how Java sees uh, the underlying resources. C groups were not um, the real concept before Java 1.8. Uh, in the 1.8, there were uh, experimental features released, and after that, it was actually productionalized. So any applications that are running uh, new or building new is not a problem, but if you have any requirements to run under 1.8, um, some things to be considered. Along with um, this, as we are running multiple microservices, multiple replicas of these microservices, in a shared environment, um, you will always have the problem of noisy neighbor. Um, in the beginning, what we have seen is uh, one of our architects built a container with a continuous loop, which crossed uh, and deployed it with multiple replicas in it, which caused actually a frequent container failure, a lot of OM killers, and actually brought down the entire cluster for us. So uh, something to consider on that aspect. Um, it may not be your fault, but the environment might still impact you. So as we are thinking of Java, uh, the JDK, JREs, we're actually traditionally built um, to support uh, export artifacts that can run in any environment. 
right? Uh, earlier, when you were building your jars, you don't know what your client environment is, so you would Java is best solution for you. But in the new world, as you are not shipping just your jars and wars, you're shipping your Docker images, so you already know your runtime environment. It is always best to use the latest features of modular JDK, where you can actually compile the code to the operating system of your Docker image, which makes it much more faster. And the compile time, runtime, also reduces your Java footprint uh, in the image. Um, I think Java is evolving very good and supporting containers. With the newer versions of 9 and 10, you're seeing these modular features coming in, which we should be leveraging. That addresses our stateless applications. But as part of the architecture, we also have stateful applications. So when we talk about stateful applications in containers, this is the first thing that we were advised not to do, both from our developer, uh, the database administrator community, uh, also from the products that we were trying to put in databases, and for various reasons, because they were not operationally built to run in containers. And you look at it, uh, you have various types of databases that you would be dealing with uh, in the cluster architecture. Some have master-slave architecture, some have multi-master, some have quorum-based uh, architecture in the clustering aspects. These are all critical for your operational aspects on how you can keep your cluster always up and available. Right? Because we were, the reason we were not advised to go ahead with putting databases in containers were that databases typically expect the state to be persistent. That is, they want their IPs to be persistent on where to find a master always. So if the master goes down, it will always come up in the same IP address so that the cluster is always created. Right? In the container world, that is not possible. IPs are not static for containers, so you don't know where your master comes up in. When you look at it, um, the services like service discovery are your friends for solving these kind of problems. Our approach was anything that an operator can do manually can be automated using service discovery, and that is how we have done with uh, multiple databases like Cassandra, Mongo, Elastic, um, MariaDB, uh, including Ping Directory. Uh, so the other aspect is uh, when you're trying to deploy these databases in cloud, you have a requirement of sticking to the volumes that your data will be persistent. Because what you're shipping is just the Docker image of the application. Your data is actually maintained on the volume, which is mounted onto the Docker uh, container. Uh, some things to consider is uh, these volumes are specific to availability zones, uh, but your cluster can span across availability zones. So use the features of node affinity and anti-affinity to pin the cluster um, no, uh, containers to a specific AZ. Uh, however, you have replicas working in the other AZ. Also, when we're building these uh, container images, there's a concept of cattle versus uh, pet. Typically, you want uh, a certain uh, database instances to come only in certain order or uh, only in certain locations, uh, whereas cattle is any instance can come up in any sequence, but still be able to join the cluster. This actually, this approach or the thought process actually helped us in building images that are, that can actually work for a new deployment or can also work for an upgrade, that is an in-place upgrade. So with this, we are actually able to do a database update on runtime without impacting the service. So the way on how uh, instance would come up check the existing environment, figure out where it appears as are, and then try to join the cluster, actually help us uh, building the images in that way. Now, this is a, just a concept about how you're deploying in a single data center, but databases, when they grow across clusters, the whole dynamics changes on your, based on your runtime, like Kubernetes, uh, egress IPs, or AWS regions, um, all of them play in a factor on um, actually helping you in this one. With this um, distributed architecture with multiple microservices, uh, operationally, observability is something that you want, uh, which will keep you safe and secure, feeling that uh, giving you a current status of the environment. So in, tracing is the key for having that visibility in microservices as well. 
right? Adding tracing to all of your code will give you visibility on all the transactions that are happening, the time that it is taking per transaction, and which microservices is taking how much time. And even if there's a failure, you know which microservice is failing specifically on those things. It is easier to add these tracing, and these are not something that uh, custom coded. These are some of the standards that are published by CNCF. Um, that is becoming industry standard on how you can add tracing and how you can integrate with tracing systems. Uh, for the custom code, it is very easy to add, but in a scenario where you have a mixture of your custom code and off-the-shelf product, uh, you might uh, run into a situation where you cannot add tracing to that off-the-shelf product. So you would end up uh, at that point in time. I think this is an opportunity where all the products should start thinking about how they will give you an option to choose your custom logging solution. This will also give you an option to choose your custom tracing solution that you can integrate into the existing environment. Tracing in multi-threaded applications is also a, a bigger challenge, um, but I think the CNCF is still working on those, uh, closing those gaps. Once you get the traceability, um, also the monitoring comes in that gives your ops teams a visibility into the environment. Because this is so fragmented, uh, monitoring is becoming a critical thing as well. Traditionally, you have seen uh, applications were being monitored. Every dependent component would say, I want to know if my services that I'm dependent are live or not. So this is becoming mostly like 60% of the time the app is trying to answer all of those questions than actually serving the real purpose of it. So I think we should change that approach on trying to look at how service discovery can help us because the Kubernetes by default monitors your containers, whether they are live or not, and operational, and it can publish that information out. So we are, what we have done is we have integrated with the service discovery of Kubernetes and actually leveraged it into our monitoring systems. All right. And circuit breakers is another thing as you're looking at um, having dependencies in your service calls. Uh, instead of bombarding the system, even though it is down, identifying the failure and choosing an alternate path or giving an alternate response to the user, or in some cases delaying the response is a best effort um, than actually hitting the system in microservices. So, Makesh should talk about yeah. some of the deployment. I think there were some learnings and certain sort of decisions we took even for developers. Uh, Dilip spoke a lot about uh, the operational aspects. But even for development, what we noticed in the container world is local development becomes a, a challenge of sorts because you cannot uh, run all of the microservices on your on your local sometimes. You have to be able to uh, write mock services to, to handle that or, or look at certain native IDEs that really connect back into a, a Kubernetes cluster out on your dev or your stage environment and then make your local IDE of choice sort of act uh, as, it, as if it's part of that environment. So native IDEs were something that uh, you know, we looked at. We are in the process of uh, you know, sort of rolling it out soon. Config management, I spoke about this in the, in the 12 factor app. Absolutely, this is, a, this is one of the main things because as the same image moves from environment to environment, you have to make sure your uh, config, which is the only part that pretty much changes through the environments, it, you know, it stays outside. And that was one of the sort of challenges for us because traditionally developers are used to bundling all of this and pushing it, uh, you know, as part of your your uh, release environment. So keeping it out and making that change, that mindset change, was was a challenge for us. Uh, peer review um, goes without saying. We we instituted the same sort of uh, principles that we have uh, in the open source community. You do a pull request, uh, you know, a peer of yours looks at your code, make sure everything is fine and, and uh, checks it in. And next comes really the, the choice for branching and versioning. Because there were so many uh, features that we had to um, uh, work on simultaneously, we had to have a very strong sort of branching uh, and versioning strategy. Versioning strategy again so that we could deploy multiple versions if required uh, of these microservices and then be able to do a blue-green um, deployment of them. Uh, developers are the uh, main folks who work on their containers. Uh, yesterday, I think in the Bring Your Own uh, IDAS, I had a, uh, I saw a beautiful slide of developers throwing over their code over the fence. Uh, that is something that we didn't want to do anymore. The developer owns the image also. So truly embracing the uh, DevOps model is what we, we went with. 
And quickly touch upon the, uh, the next phase that Christian spoke about, the next journey for us really, the hybrid cloud. And for us, hybrid cloud is uh, having a presence in one public uh, cloud provider in uh, addition to the on-prem private cloud that we have today. So uh, certain decisions we took early on in terms of sharding the data really helped us in that journey um, because we have data sharded for certain regions and, and we are able to sort of pick one of the regions out and deploy it in that particular region without having to slice and dice the data all over again. So that's a decision we took early on. That's definitely helping us. But again, traffic shaping is something that we are looking at because uh, taking the user to a location that's closer to their geographic location is what we want to do for performance reasons and also for compliance. So if you, if you have to um, route the user in Europe to a center in Europe for compliance reasons, we want to be able to do that. So that's the, the other sort of um, item that we are looking at. We didn't want any change to the application stack because we want the same stack to run on our private cloud and public cloud. So that's a, that's a, a big decision we took. Again, the, the requirement for that is that we will go to any um, provider, cloud provider that provides us Docker and Kubernetes as the native sort of uh, framework. Any any uh, cloud provider that provides us Kubernetes either as a managed service or for us to run for it, we are able to take it. And, and those are the ones that we started looking at to choose our platform. We were okay with uh, trying to um, choose a, a pass management layer, management layer in terms of the, the CI, CD, the logging, tracing, and monitoring that I spoke about in the architecture on the left-hand side. Those are things that we are okay to choose, which are native to the platform, uh, because they, they sort of give us better handle and hooks into their uh, components. So that's something that we are okay to take, but the, the, the main stack that we had on the left of microservices, the UI, and the, the databases is something that we don't want to change at all. Single pane of glass across uh, all of the clouds because we have distributed uh, or we will have distributed uh, instances. We want to make sure that our operations get that single view that they can look at all of the data across it and, and take some uh, sort of decisions based on that instead of having to log into multiple uh, you know, uh, instances to, to sort of monitor the data. Some security aspects that you would want to keep in mind, um, configurations for some of these things might be might differ based on uh, you know, the technology uh, that is provided by the cloud provider. So you want to make sure that your on-prem instance and the instance uh, that is provided by the cloud um, provider is, is uh, close, or at least you can have similar configurations on both so that it's easy for you to sort of deploy and, and handle that. And next is really uh, our path from hybrid to multi-cloud. Multi-cloud is just multiple cloud providers, public cloud providers, not just a single uh, cloud provider. That's going to be our uh, next sort of future journey. Um, but for now, hybrid cloud is what we are working on, and we are sort of uh, close to closing this uh, through. I'll hand this off to Christina as she sort of takes us through some of the other learnings. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because uh, I'd like to leave five minutes um, for some question and answer. We, as we went down this journey and started executing about two and a half years ago, we did put, we were the first customer that actually took Ping Directory and deployed it in production in a container. So we learned a bunch of things um, around a lot of the things that we've been talking about, about cloud native and the 12 factor apps in terms of using um, images, using some of the uh, DS config commands that uh, Ping Directory did so that we have implemented some Python scripts that automated all of the uh, configurations and commands on top of the base image that we uh, put together. Um, you only also want to back up those configs. Um, we also, because of uh, regional and the GDPR and the thought of we've deploying it around the world and be able to pull off a specific country or a specific region. We, even though we deployed in the United States in our data centers, we sharded the data into uh, Americas, uh, Europe, and Asia. Um, we have three clusters per each in each data center. We already architected it that way so that as we uh, go to a hybrid cloud, we have the option at any time to pull a specific country or specific region to that data center. Um, of course, in this world, you have to be able to have the right kind of uh, robust, robust health checks and the key impacts so that you minimize the impacts of any downtime. Um, there's a plugins that are, uh, and secret management. There's also lots of plugins that, uh, that is available for uh, a ping directory that you can leverage. That we, we've used that to customize some of it. it it's pretty easy. It allows you to do the implementation. 
There are some challenges. I won't go through this. Ping Directory has now a new version that allows you to deploy in a container. Um, we are in the process of upgrading and um, passing back any learnings that we have so that all of you, if you're doing this now or you're thinking about doing it, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we can uh, be happy to do some shared learnings. So the last thing I would cover is for our CIMs, opportunities for the industry is around, I think, multi-tenancy. I think vendors do do well in terms of multi-tenancy when you're talking about a specific product to, to leverage that identity as a service capability. But as a company like ours where you have different business units that you're trying to cater to or different kinds of areas can cater to, that kind of ultra pull it together uh, form of multi-tenancy is not there yet. The other area is delegated admin. I think we have marketer models where we want to be able to, for example, um, authenticate a certain vet partner and then pass that context or token off to let them into X customer. Whereas today's model, you put that partner in that customer, which has life cycle implications and the industry needs to deal with that. The other areas, of course, IoT bots and APIs. I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. I think we as an industry have done well with the user, but this area is not as well done in terms of opportunities to do that. And then also, I think licensing models aren't built for this also. Privacy consent, I think this is starting to come into play, but there's a lot of opportunities to do that. There's a fragmented amount of other capabilities coming in and products coming in the privacy space, but not exactly all integrated as a solution. And then to some of what Dalip and Makesh talked about is the really, in a cloud native world, you need to be able to look at the whole flow of tracing and logging. And it's not a just an outward bound. It has to be a life cycle and flow back. So we want products to have that, you know, standardized way of tracing and logging so that we can pick that up and provide it as a signals into our cloud native and make it self-healing. Uh, we do that today, but it's, customize, it'd be nice for the industry to do that. Okay, so we have a couple, three minutes left. Um, open it up for questions. Go ahead. Oh, Mike's coming to you. So uh, my question is, do you support the concept of multiple personas? Uh, you mentioned earlier that some users can log in with social media, while others are required to use MFA. So I was wondering if you support the concept where one person could exist in both spaces and just kind of switch persona. Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, because we do allow the, the concept of having multiple authenticators, uh, which is what I believe you're saying persona. So you could choose to have or authenticate with your local user ID password that you have with us or with a social login. Again, we have to sort of wrap this in the context of what the product requires, because that's the other big requirement uh, we have to meet. If there is a product that can accept a social authentication, we do pass that through. If not, then we have to really step that up, bring that into the context of a local uh, in a user session, and then pass this on. But from capability standpoint, yes, but it's again wrapped in the context of what the product requires. Excellent. Uh, if you have done the uh, data sharing, between the Asia Pacific. I'm sure you have a partner who has the ability to do the business in all three continents, right? I mean, you may have a partner who has people in Pacific, Asia, all the regions. And do you have a virtual organization on top of this and based upon the user you do the sharing? Uh, how did you manage a single partner in three different continents? Uh, the other question yeah. I've done in our case is just to, uh, did you do the localization? Uh, because uh, Keyboards are different, <laughs> languages are different, right? And browsers are different from the Asia Pacific region to the US. So, how did you manage the local language? Yeah, we do support uh, not all the languages we like to support. Localized wise, we do support. Um, 18 languages, mostly on the display. I think the input part of like name is always a, a difficult piece. Um, we put the users into the different shards based on when they register with us, what country they select. And I think uh, we, there's a ping directory has a proxy capability that you can find and direct them to the appropriate shard. Any other questions? I think this one here, right here. Great presentation. 
One question I have on authentication. Do you use any vendor for the authentication or do you use a cloud native authentication like AWS Cognito or any identity platform? So our current deployment is on a private cloud and we provide the authentication. So uh, the, the uh, platform is built from a bunch of uh, open source components. Um, so we use one of the open source access management provided by Red Hat oh, as our main, uh, yeah, as our main component that does that piece for us. Is the reason why you didn't choose the cloud provider for the authentication piece? Um, we couldn't at that point because it, it was on a private cloud, but we did look at a bunch of existing, um, you know, options at that point. Some of the requirements that we have were not yet supported in those. Uh, now they, they have after two years, but then at that point we had to go um, either work with them to customize their product and that didn't meet our timeline or sort of take that journey ourselves and we chose to do the latter. Thank you. Just to add to that is um, we, the business models that we were trying to support also required a local setup. So that is the whole reason of putting everything in containers so that we can ship it along with the product. Choosing a cloud provider requires us to connect back onto the provider. Uh, in some of our product deployment scenarios, that is not possible. It's true. That is. Yeah, because of our business models, we have to do on-prem, in the cloud, embedded in a partner solution. Because of that, we had to make it all containerized and supportable in all different formats. So that's why we didn't uh, pick a particular vendor at the time. Any other questions? All right, we're out of time. We're happy to take some questions on the side if you have anything. Thank you. Thank you.